This weekend, 250 education workers representing their 55,000 education workers from across our province met on, at the CUPE Ontario School Board Council of Unions Leadership Conference. They unanimously voted to endorse their bargaining committee's recommendation to call for a strike vote as a demonstration of workers' resolve to achieve our affordable and necessary proposals for improving working and learning conditions in Ontario schools in the face of high inflation and a callously disrespectful offer from the Ford government. These vital school board workers in 2022 in Doug Ford's Ontario are paid on average $39,000 a year. Along with my coworkers, I was proud to reconfirm our commitment to fight for decent wages, increased services for students, and a reinvestment in public education after a decade of government cuts to education funding. This is important because despite all of this government's bragging, the numbers do not lie. Doug Ford's progressive conservative government cut education funding by $800 per student when adjusted for inflation over its first term. With 2 million students in schools across Ontario, that's a $1.6 billion funding cut this year alone. Money that should have been used to improve supports for students, increase staffing levels to guarantee services, and raise the wages of education workers to pull us back from the brink of poverty. My 55,000 coworkers and I are bargaining for the public good. We are bargaining for your daughters and your sons, your grandchildren, your friends, for all Ontario kids to get ahead. Education worker proposals for student success and good jobs, if accepted, would, one, guarantee increased services for students, two, protect service levels against cuts, three, help solve school board problems retaining and recruiting workers, and four, increase government funding for children's education after 10 years of real cuts. We are fighting for enough library workers to make sure school libraries are open and reading opportunities are available to kids all the time. We are fighting for every four and five-year-old to get the play-based learning that is so necessary, support that only comes from having an early childhood educator in every kindergarten classroom. We are fighting for adequate staffing of secretaries in school offices and enough lunchroom supervisors to keep students safe. We're fighting for more custodians, maintenance workers, and tradespeople to keep your schools clean and to begin to tackle the $16.3 billion repair backlog. While it's definitely not a guarantee that the lowest paid education workers will withdraw our labor, a strike vote should be a signal to the provincial government and school boards that the status quo and concessions are not what students, Ontario families, or workers deserve. Of course, Education Minister Stephen Lecce is likely to continue to spread fear and project more blame because it's easier to fear monger than it is to face facts. The truth is our proposal includes a wage increase of $3.25 per hour for a group of workers that has been on the front line and paid on average only $39,000 per year. The Ford's government's offer was just 33 cents to 53 cents per hour, the equivalent that is less than a tank of gas per month. Given the high inflation that everyone is experiencing, this is a pay cut. The disrespectful Ford Leachy offer also cements a decade of cuts to real per student funding that has put considerable and completely avoidable strains on schools and the students that learn there. Minister Leachy is acting like a schoolyard bully again, picking on Ontario's lowest paid education workers. It's disrespectful and it must stop. Education workers holding strike votes is about workers understanding and using our collective power to win long overdue gains for students, Ontario's families and each other. 
education workers holding strike votes is a direct result of the Ford's government refusing to use the 90 days this summer since we served notice to bargain to get a fair deal done. Education workers holding strike votes is part of the process to show this government we are united and ready to fight for what our students and communities need. Education workers holding strike votes is about sending a message to the Ford government that they are responsible for creating the problem and it's on them to fix it. 10 years of government's attack on education worker wages and government interference in our collective bargaining rights has resulted in wage settlements from 2012 to 2021 that equaled only 8.8% compounded. While inflation to the end of 2021 has totaled 19.5%. This includes us doing our time under Bill 124. So we've already taken a 10.7 wage cut and we will not take another wage cut again. I want to finish by sharing some of the findings from a survey that QP OSBCU education workers completed in September and October of 2021. 71 to 75% of education workers are women. 60% of education workers are laid off every summer with the majority needing an unemployment insurance in order to survive. But even in the best case, EI will only replace 55% of eligible earnings. Women are overrepresented in 10 month positions, getting laid off each June. 81.7% of women who responded to the survey are in 10 month positions, while only 21, 20.1% .1 of men said the same. But this is only part of the problem. In general, the work of women is undervalued. There is a profound and persistent gender wage gap in Ontario, and successive governments have exasperated this province wide gender wage gap by attacking the wages of public sector workers, a sector that is predominantly staffed by women. 51% of education workers said they have to work at least one additional job to make ends meet. This jumps to 64.5% for education workers who are sole income earners. 91% have faced at least one form of financial hardship because of their low wages. 41% have been late making a bill payment because their wages are insufficient to meet their needs. 24% have confirmed struggling to pay for gas or public transit. And that was before we had the wage or the gas prices spike. 27% of respondents reported to having to cut back on food. And that is before the explosion of inflation in 2022 and is an issue that Jamie West brought up last week at Queen's Park. Over 20% faced housing insecurity and worried about where they're going to live. When reading through the comments, there were many education workers saying they're still living with their parents because they couldn't afford their own place, or they're living with friends and roommates because they cannot afford to live independently. I want to leave you with a comment that was written by an educational work assistant, an education worker who makes less than $39,000 a year. When folks ask how poverty leads to terrible situations, remember that this isn't any different. I've had to make choices to survive that I wish I didn't have to. As a professional, well-educated person, I should not have to go without eating for a few days because I simply cannot afford to get groceries. And let's be real, it's not healthy foods as those are costly and they don't last longer than a few days. Frontline education workers make an invaluable contribution to our communities. Without us, schools could not function and students wouldn't get the supports they need and deserve. The proposals for student success and good jobs that we have put forward are reasonable, they are necessary, and they are affordable. I'll now open for questions, and I do see I have some hands up, so I'm going to go to Richard. Richard Southern, go ahead. Hi, Laura. Richard Southern, City News. Um, did you provide, did QP provide a uh, a response to that government's offer, a counter offer? And if so, yeah. what was it? No, it was very, very short and sweet. And we said, no, this is not acceptable. 
Okay, so you didn't provide another offer. I know there's going to be parents out there. They're going to say, we've had so many school interruptions over the past two years, and the government's offering 8%. You know, not, not many people in the private sector are getting more than that. Why dangle this possibility of a strike now after all we've been through over, over two years? Yeah, so let's be fair. There is actually private sector wages that are far exceeding 8% increases. As a matter of fact, we have provided several, uh, the Carpenters Union, Leuna, uh, even in the um, grocery sector, uh, these wages have gone up more than 8%. But let's be clear, it's not 8%. It's 2% for only those who make under $40,000. It's 1.25 if you make over $40,000. And so really, um, it's a two-tiered system of which we do not bargain two-tiered systems. And it is a pay cut in the face of inflation that is at 8%. And Laura, when is this vote? Uh, the vote Sorry. will be taking place the end of September. So there is lots of time for this government to get to the bargaining table with real offers and real discussions. They've had 90 days to do so. We really encourage them to think beyond the three days that they've offered us in September. So the earliest a strike could be is when? Uh, the earliest a strike could be would not be into, until October. Thank you. No worries. Ahmed, go ahead, please. Um, uh, hi, Laura. It's Ahmed. Um, uh, my first question, Minister Lecce was out with a statement this morning. Um, he said that QP was on a path to a strike before they even saw our first proposal. What is your response to Minister Lecce's claim? I think Minister Lecce needs to understand that we're not on a path to strike. We're on a path to ensure that we have real services in our school boards. So beyond his really insulting, you know, 2% or 1.25%, they also refused to increase funding to improve services that students need. They also refused to look at any sort of services and guarantees of services, instead looking for more flexibility, which means that uh, boards can cut more and more staff at a time that we actually know more and staff, more and more staff are needed. Uh, it goes way beyond just the wages. And so, no, this is not about a strike. And the minister is really quite adhering to this. As a matter of fact, I believe that the minister was talking about strike before our proposal was actually passed. And I was looking through the last negotiations when there was um the union threatened to withdraw full services and then you reached a deal later in the evening. Um, most school boards or some school boards had said that we're gonna close schools if QP workers withdraw, withdrew their services. Um, the, the government's maintained that, you know, they're committed to getting all kids back in school full time for the full year. So what's your message to parents who are uncertain about potential instability with the start of the school year? And um, are you looking at um, a phased in job action if, if it's required? Will it be phased in? Will it be full withdrawal um, right away? So our message to parents and I think to the government is we know that the services that we provide are vital. That is why education workers were on site in our schools providing services throughout the pandemic when so many other workers were able to work from home. And we should not need to threaten strike to have folks recognize how important our work is. And if our work is important, and we all know that it is, then it's incumbent on this government to pay us properly, to fund it properly, and to ensure that the services are secure. And so our message to parents is you need to be asking the government Gonna ask Chris to Chris to un Hi there, can you hear me? Hi Chris, sorry about that. Go Hi. ahead. Sorry, can you hear me? I can now, yeah. 
Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, so you said that you've rejected the government's offer. So what happens next at the next bargaining dates then? Are you going to pass an offer back? Are you going to wait for them to give you another offer? What's, can you just explain what the process is? Absolutely. So there are many pieces that we still have not received any response to. Uh, and at the end of our time together last week, we said we are awaiting responses. So things on service security, things on increased funding to ensure services are in place. Even something as simple as violence prevention training. Uh, we are looking for those responses. And once we get those responses, we'll be in a better place to do a full response to them. Okay. And you've also said that the government's first offer was disrespectful, but I'm just wondering, I mean, is this not part of bargaining? I mean, generally you don't sort of land on a first offer from either side. So was this first offer so egregious? Yeah, listen, I we've been through this before, Chris, you and I, and and I agree, you know, we no one comes in with their final offer the first time. But I think there's a real difference between what they are offering and really what the result was. Um, you know, there is a, you know, the right now it's a very low ball offer. Um, and it really is quite interesting because he's very good at talking about what our offer is and kind of mixing it up. But yet what he is offering um, completely negates most of the things that we actually need in order to ensure student success. And instead is focusing on keeping the most vital education workers in ongoing poverty. His proposal still would keep us below what Doug Ford himself considers a low income. Is there any other questions? Oh, Allison, yes, Allison Jones, you always have a problem with. <laughs> Yeah, it's, hands, but here, I do. Here, it's here you are. Assume. I should just know. <laughs> I never seem to be able to. Um, thank you for calling on me, though. I just have a um, couple, hopefully, quick questions. You had mentioned to Richard that the vote will be the end of September. Do you have an exact date? Uh, yeah, it'll be the last week of September. Voting opens on September 23rd. Okay, for a couple days? or uh, It'll be open until October 2nd. So quite a, a substantial period of time as we continue to ne hopefully negotiate um, that actually the voting will not start until we've actually exhausted all days that have been offered to us by the government and the school board association. Okay, and what are the next dates that you have coming up? So we have the 16th, the 20th and the 21st. And that's it. Oh, we also have this Friday, pardon me, I, I overspoke. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions? All right, well, I'm sure we will be in touch more and more um, and we will be joining together with workers this evening um, to be discussing this with them and hearing more from them. Uh, and we will be definitely keeping in touch as we move forward. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And if there are any other questions, please feel free to contact Ken Marsnick uh, who can help you out.